Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Demo Day at the uh, Upside of Downturns Summit. My name is Alex Gordon Furs. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer here at Startup Grind. I'm super happy to have you all here and to see this incredible summit happening uh, right in front of our eyes. Today, we have five incredibly exciting startups pitching from across the world, um, and they span across industries such as AI, fintech, edtech, uh, transportation, and health tech. Each of these companies has been chosen out of hundreds of applications from our startup membership program, and all of them are currently raising money, uh, ranging from $2 million to $20 million, uh, I believe. So we're super excited to showcase them today to our audience of investors, um, startup grind directors, of course, and company, company executives. The structure of the demo day um, is as a pitch competition. So obviously, naturally, before we start, I must quickly explain the rules. Um, Firstly, each startup will be given four minutes to pitch. Um, it's up to them whether or not they, they share their screen and share a deck or not. Um, and then after that, it will be immediately followed by three minutes of Q&A from the judges who will be scoring it all. Um, there'll be a gong for each section probably on my on my phone. Uh, so you may not hear it, but I will come in and uh, let each startup know when their time is up. Um, and then we'll move on to the next startup. Throughout the demo day, the judges will be scoring um, the answers to the Q&A as well as, of course, the pitch itself. Um, in a live document that we have access to on this side. Um, and then the, the winners will be simply chosen by the top scoring startups. The top two scoring startups will, will be announced at the end in reverse order, with the winner, of course, being brought back on um, to say a quick word uh, and also tell us you know, what the, the top way that we can help them is today, uh, including you know, how much they're raising in their round. So... There we have it. Uh, obviously, we're almost ready to start, but first, I, I think it's time to introduce the judges. So how about each of you uh, jump in and, and give a quick introduction to yourselves? I think you'll you'll probably do it better than better than I will. Let's start with you, Neil. Thanks, Alex. Uh, thanks to Startup Grind. Um, appreciate the global focus as my parents were immigrants here to the United States, uh, Accenture Goldman Sachs before business school. And then 23 years as a venture capitalist. So I uh, started out at a publicly traded one called CMGI that competed with SoftBank. Did a couple of years in corporate and then joined General Catalyst Partners in 2004 as a partner. And was there for 12 years as the firm grew from 200 million to I think it's 20, 15, 20 billion now. Um, and uh, started Defy uh, seven, no, six years ago. And uh, we raised a couple of funds and $700 million. We invest, we're generalists, uh, gen we're generalists at heart, uh, have five partners and really, really fortunate to be here today. Thanks. Thank you so much, Neil. Uh, on to you, Luke. We'll go with you next. Thanks, Alex. I uh, appreciate it. Um, uh, Luke Charrington, um, founder and uh, GP at Latitude Ventures. Uh, my background is first and foremost as an operator. Um, I built a couple of B2B tech companies in Southern California to various degrees of success, um, but did sell one of them and um, then helped build out a, a venture team um, focused on corporate venture um, and investing in B2B technology companies uh, where there were commercial relationships and pushing those commercial relationships alongside of the investment dollars. Um, that's beca become Latitude, um, which I've launched a couple of years ago, um, typically looking at slightly later stage businesses, Series A, Series B, sometimes Series C, um, and um, focused on companies that kind of power the infrastructure in the back end um, of large corporations, logistics, supply chain, manufacturing, things along those lines. Um, and that's all in partnership with a large corporate and LP network um, comprising some of the largest Fortune 500s in the world, like your AB InBev's, Kraft Heinz, Unilever, Procter & Gamble, um, a lot of these folks that we connect with regularly. So happy to be here and happy to learn more about the companies. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Luke. Uh, Shripriya, we'll finish up with you. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Hi, I'm Shripriya Mahesh. Um, I've been in Silicon Valley since 99, primarily in operating roles. Um, I ran global product at eBay for a number of years before running the US product marketing business, which was the revenue side. And uh, before coming back to tech, I went to graduate film school at NYU, uh, which was a blast. I've been institutionally investing since 2015, first at Omidia Network, and then we spun out Sparrow Ventures in 2018. It's a $120 million fund focused at the early stage. We write two to $4 million checks uh, into companies that are building the things that make life worth living. Primarily, we focus on well-being, sustainability, and learning work and play. So that's us, and I'm excited to hear the pitches today. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, 
I think we're we're just about there. So without further ado, let's bring on our first startup, which is uh, Dropstat and Sarah Well. Sarah, do we have you? We do. Brilliant, brilliant. Are you ready? I am. Good stuff. So I'm going to give you a countdown, and then I'm going to hit the um, hit the timer, and we're ready to go. So three, two, one, let's go. My name is Sarah Well, and uh, we are on a mission at Dropstat to rescue uh, healthcare facilities from the coming crisis. I spent years working critical care in some of the better funded hospitals where we were posting $400 million per year in profits, and yet we never had sufficient staff to provide safe staffing environments for our patients. Um, Net effect, as you can imagine, is a decrease in quality care and significant revenue losses for facilities that don't have enough staff to even admit new patients. Um, Our concern is that these uh, these issues with short staffing were before we lost 500,000 nurses to COVID fatigue, and now we have 1 million more expected to age out in the next year and change roughly 38% of our labor force in, that is the operational arm of medicine, will be lost, and that will have significant public health um, impacts. So, you know, working through healthcare operations and working my way up, I realized that there's a lot of process and efficiency and opportunity to recoup a lot of financial waste. Um, Essentially, our goal is to drive down labor operations costs by tens of millions of dollars per facility while optimizing the number of shifts filled, creating safer staffing environments. Impacts to healthcare facilities that don't optimize their staffing right now as we're as we're set to come into this crisis. Obviously, there's sanctions and penalties from CMS, million dollars per occurrence where they're short staffed. And obviously, all of us have loved ones that at some point will likely have to access health care, whether to have babies or end of life. Um, and we do want the best positive outcomes. Current systems, believe it or not, are not optimized to be able to take on this challenge. They're manual, they're opaque, they are heavily reliant on schedule and there's a lot of inefficiency in the process, creating a lot of a lot of financial waste. Um, billions billions uh, have been spent on companies that seek to see this as a procurement solution where we have now travel staffing companies also responsible for driving up the cost of labor and creating travel nursing jobs. And these are all billion dollar corporations, but they're built on the back of process and efficiency. And these costs are not sustainable for healthcare. And those costs do get passed on, unfortunately, to Americans who are now over $100 million in crippling healthcare debt. So our goal and what we have done is we've created a Tesla I system that eliminates a lot of scheduler inefficiency and we automate the entire process and it looks like this. We now have machine learning and AI that predicts scheduling needs, automatically posts its own schedules, leverage the, leverages the entire staffing resource team, internal staff, cross-trained teams, all outsourced um, agencies and third-party systems are automatically managed through our system. There's cost controls and we are gamified on the staff side so that we create a fun experience for staff. We have a lot of burnout prevention tools integrated. And the most important thing is that we provide actionable insights to our uh, clients. This is a very large demographic. We are agnostic on our back end. We can scale out across multiple departments beyond nursing. Our clients have seen an increased number of shifts filled, dramatically decreased labor operations costs. Our first three clients have become our investors because we for X to what we thought we were going to save them. It's about a 20 to one ROI. The cost is $1,000 per month per license, and they will save about $20,000 per license. So it's a significant labor operational uh, decrease for our clients. And to give you a rough idea, typical hospitals have about 50 to 75, 75, 50 licenses each. So um, it's a pretty big, uh, big deal size. I think I'm at my four minute mark. Yeah, you've got 10 seconds left, so you nailed that. Well done, Sarah. Thank you so much. Uh, great pitch. Uh, I'm going to stop the gong so it doesn't, doesn't interrupt me. Um, yeah, great, great pitch. Thank you so much. Um, now we'll go to judge Q&A. So um, perhaps, uh, Luke, I don't know if you've got a, a question you want to you start yeah, with. I, I'd want, I, I'm just to, just so, to understand the pain point here for, for hospitals, is this primarily around retention? Um, and are, are these are these folks leaving the actual workforce? Or are they leaving an individual facility? Um, I'm just trying to understand the pain point a little bit more. Yeah, 
That's a great question. Um, it's no staffing is no different than pain, where it's a collection of issues that contribute. And one of the most concerning is that when we run our our facilities and our staff short, and they have a license to protect, um, they are they don't feel safe to practice. So the biggest contributor to burnout and the biggest reason people leave is because they're short staffed. Believe it or not. So our ability to optimize the procurement process, not just looking at it. Well, if we can't find staff internally, let's go to a two sided marketplace. That that would be like my shirt's dirty, I'm going to buy a new one. There are internal staff available. So part of our process is that all shifts are communicated to internal staff across multiple departments where they're cross-trained to work, as well as uh, being able to automate the communication across all third-party systems. And the reason that's important is because agencies are not all priced the same. And it's right now, believe it or not, at the scheduler's discretion, and there's no transparency on whether they communicate with agency A or agency B, and there could be a $30 an hour price difference. That doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're doing this 100, 200 times per day, per facility, uh, that becomes over a million dollars a year. Uh, we've got a minute and a half, so maybe one 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 more question. Shripriya, do you want to take this one? Yeah, tell me a little bit about how you integrate into the hospital systems. And, you know, it seems like you need a lot of data to know which nurse is cross-trained how and how to pull them in. So how long does an integration take? And um, for your first three customers, how many licenses do they have? Um, so in terms of our integrations, we are able to go live in 48 hours. We don't on the change management side because that's overwhelming for the operational teams. We like to manage the change as, as a bit of an art and let them know that change is coming and, and kind of ease them into that. In terms of our integrations, um, there it, it sounds complicated on the outset, having worked on the systems internally, um, like all units know, uh, cardiac ICU can work in these six units. ER can work in these things. And so we've been able to just make that a switch. We can run with no integrations. We can start fully manual and I can show you kind of off call what that looks like, but we've, we have set it up so that we can start running immediately. And as we integrate, we're more efficient, but we didn't want that to be a drag on our process. Uh, oh, and sorry, your second question, um, uh, license count was, uh, 10, seven and 45 for the three investors. Wow, congratulations on 45. That's that's a big number to go out with. Thank you, thank you. They just started buying Good Samaritan Hospital. So it's a, we have a, a pretty good line of sight, hopefully into the growth on the in the enterprise space. Great stuff. All right, well, again, bang on the bang on the, the three minute mark for the Q&A. Sarah, fantastic job. Thank you so much. Congratulations, uh, you Sarah. Yourself. Awesome job. Awesome yeah. job. Thanks, Neil. Um, if you could take yourself off camera and um, on mute, and then we'll bring on the next startup. Thanks again. So next up, we have Alexander Zheltov from Educate Online. Do we have you? Great name, by the way. Yes, we do. Hi, Alex. <laughs> dear judges, dear uh, everyone who joins us on this call. Hi. Big pleasure to be here. Great to have you. Um, so would you like to just share your screen, and then I'll give you a three, two, one countdown. Ready to go? Okay. Yes. Three, two, one, off you go. Hi, my name is Alexander Zeltov. Um, I've been an international student myself. And during this journey, I found out that international education is super expensive, especially at school and university level. And when I came out of uni in London, which was called business school, I thought, how can I make it more affordable and accessible to the emerging countries and the students in these countries. And that's how I came up with the idea of Educate Online. Educate Online is a platform which connects students from international countries, from emerging countries to the schools in US, Canada, and the UK, where these students study virtually. That means that the students stay in their home country and they can study with the world's best teachers, they can get uh, the diplomas and they can actually afford it because if you look at maybe a private school in the US, you'll um, boarding school, you'll probably pay like 50K USD per year. Whereas with Educate Online, the, the students and the families, they only pay like two to 4K per year, which makes it affordable to the middle-class families all over the globe. Then they can later proceed to the top universities, colleges, good universities and colleges all over the world. Um, so we started this in 2020. Uh, now we have 27 countries where we are present and 15,000 children are currently studying and uh, they're our paying users. 
Uh, right now, uh, we have over 750 schools that we have connected onto our platform. And the way we um, get students is by two, th uh, two ways. So one of the ways is B2C. Uh, so when we do different trials, webinars, and we onboard them on our platform, and another way is B2B, where we work with educational counselors and agencies all over the world. In terms of our revenue, so now it's October 2022, we are about to hit uh, the $2 million MRR mark. And uh, by the end of the year, we'll get to $2.5 million MRR, uh, which will give us the $30 million ARR by the end of the year. And if we look at over the last three years, we've grown on average 15% month on month since launch. Um, one of the things we started doing at first in 2020, we started with such countries as Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and many other places where we were uh, getting students. And in 2021 and 2022, we managed to expand further and now 46% of our revenues come from India, 21% from Brazil, and you can see uh, the other countries uh, on the screen there. And we see that uh, the problem with access to quality education is really, really big. And just for one country alone, such as India, we see that um, there are 265 million um, school-aged pupils. And we see that our serviceable and attainable market in terms of the size uh, is $10 billion per year only in that country alone if we serve only 4 million students. And we are on the way to do that. So uh, the main thing that drives us is, of course, our mission. And uh, by 2024, we are going to scale to 100 emerging countries. The market demand is so big that uh, it's easy for us to expand into. The way we make money is we agree on a certain price with schools and they pay us a commission on all of the fees. And that gives us a three, around a $300 million, uh, sorry, $300 uh, customer acquisition cost at this moment and a student LTV uh, of around two and a half to fifteen thousand dollars. The team is really international, uh, so we have people working from uh, the MENA region, India, UK, Canada. So it's it's really fun to work in such a team, and uh, and we aim uh, to get to two uh, four hundred million dollar uh, ARR run rate by two thousand twenty five. So happy to answer your questions and thank you for your attention. Another one bang on, Alex. Uh, thank you so much for a great presentation there. Um, Alex, we'll go straight, go straight into Q&A. Congratulations on building a great business. You should be very proud. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, we've done a little bit in the space, the competitive landscape, Who? what are the alternatives to some of the schools and, and to the consumer side of the business? Or are you really going after markets that just don't have an alternative to for consumers? Uh, so one of the alternatives is um, local international schools. So if you're a student from India, for example, you have the IB, A level, and you name it, kind of, kind of, kind of schools and curriculums. But uh, the problem there is that in the emerging countries, the demand is so large that even these schools they will be overcrowded, and the students will not get this personal attention uh, that they require. And an online landscape, which uh, we are part of. Um, we make learning really personalized. So we'll have maybe six to 10 students in one class. We'll have one-on-one -on -one tutoring uh, when needed. And the fact that the, uh, the teachers don't need to travel any distance uh, means that we can get the highest quality of teachers onto the platform. Uh, so because nobody really wants to go to <laughs> place one, two, three to teach and <laughs> to fly all, all over the place. But via uh, the video conference software and our platform, it's much easier to do that. Got it. Um, quick question. So, you know, you had Stanford Online listed as one of your schools. The prices for Stanford Online are comparable to any private school. And like also they teach during U.S. business hours, mostly um, U.S. school hours, I guess. So I'm just wondering, how does it work for international stu kids where the time difference may be 12 and a half hours? Oh, all right. So Stanford, uh, I guess it's just, uh, it's one of the brands that we work with, but it's not the main sell because um, they're really kind of a compa super competitive schools and one of the super competitive schools. So the, what we target is the more of the mass market. Uh, so the students that might be CB students, so we're non-selective on that front. 
And then uh, the way we do uh, the teacher recruiting is that uh, a lot of the teachers during COVID decided that why shall I pay rent in the United States? If I'm going to stay at home, I could do that rather in Bali or <laughs> somewhere else, right? So that means that as we're now all in different locations, um, so are the teachers right now. So if you are teaching someone in Asia, you can easily get a person that will be in their time zone. And that person will be Native American or Canadian or uh, you name it. So, and we'll have the required qualifications. Uh, another way is, of course, um, a lot of the students study after their school. So they will go to their local school and then do a couple of additional hours uh, at Educate Online. And that will usually happen in the afternoon, uh, their time, which will be US or Canada morning time. And you're not recruiting the teachers themselves, yourself, right? Because you're just, you're just the funnel through which they find a matching school. Uh, so we're in charge of the IT service marketing sales side, and the schools are in charge of accreditations and recruiting teachers. Okay. But we vet the teachers through our platform. We create a ranking of teachers and of courses and of schools, therefore. Thanks, Alex. Great stuff. Uh, fantastic yes, pitch again. You. And uh, yeah, great, great Q&A. Um, if you just put yourself on um, off camera and we'll bring on the next company. Good stuff. So um, straight into Miguel Guerrero. Um, our good friend from the Start Growing community uh, from Otis AI. Miguel, do we have you? There you are. Hi, thanks for having me. Great to see you again. Uh, do you want to share your screen and we'll just make sure that all works well? Great. Okay, you know how this works. Um, I'll count down three, two, one, and then you can kick off. So three, two, one, off you go. Hi, I'm Miguel, co-founder and CEO of Otis AI. Otis is an online advertising agency in a box. We empower small businesses with an extremely easy and effective all-in-one solution to manage digital marketing, leveraging first-party customer data for marketing automation. When we started the company, COVID catalyzed and accelerated the digital transformation of small business, creating an influx of new online businesses and existing businesses going omnichannel, resulting in a huge and growing potential market. In, in fact, 70% of small businesses plan to increase their marketing budget this year. The problem for them is that they don't have the time or expertise to apply complicated advertising strategies. And when it comes to existing solutions, they're largely for upmarket or enterprise use cases and not underserved small businesses. They are complicated, time consuming and not end to end seamless solutions. And ad agencies are expensive and, and unaffordable with commissions and minimums. The answer is Otis. Our end to end solution seamlessly creates and manages all advertising assets across Facebook, Instagram, Google, and TikTok. And Otis is the only platform that connects with all of your customer data to, to provide precise targeting and optimization. We then use your images and text across all platforms to automatically create campaigns for you. And we improve campaign results over time with dynamic bid and budget adjustments across channels, audiences, and creatives. Finally, we report on exactly how each campaign is doing in real time. Otis is not only easier to use than existing upmarket and enterprise solutions, but also more effective, driving two to three times improvements in performance on average. And our fees are 40% less than traditional performance marketing agencies. We're easily the best paid ads growth solution for startups, D2C sellers, and traditional small businesses. In fact, the director of product at Facebook, who created Facebook automated ads, invested in Otis. She said, our platform is three levels above what she had built at Facebook. And we've had great progress so far. We've raised 3.2 million to date, and we've made uh, we've run a disciplined and effective operating plan, growing our net revenue 300% year over year with 450K net revenue and 1.5 million in volume. And our spring-loaded growth is continuing to accelerate. In addition to our organic growth and network effects, we also have a strong direct acquisitions channel where we use our own product to drive a healthy four-month payback period. We've also partnered with some of the largest platforms serving small businesses in the U.S., including a leading restaurant delivery platform and leading platforms in retail and services, indicating a strong trend towards large platforms prioritizing paid advertising as a key driver of growth for their long-tail merchants, adding to our defensibility and go-to-market efficiency at scale. Our all-star team has extensive experience building, selling companies and product teams, including an SMB product with an eight-figure exit, an online community with over 5 million users, 
and managing teams of over 2,000 developers. Otis is an incredible opportunity to invest early in a company that already has amazing traction and growth, large-scale partnerships in place, and a diverse leadership team with deep domain expertise and prior successes. Your investment will be a catalyst for incredible growth and huge upside potential in a worldwide potential addressable market. Thank you, and we hope you join us in our mission to level the playing field for small businesses. Nice Happy one, Miguel. to take any questions. Great Thank work. You. Let's go straight into Q&A. So who wants to start? Uh, Luke, do you want to kick off? Uh, sure. Um, I saw Highline Beta on there as an investor, so Ben's a good friend. I think we might have actually met before, Maria. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I used to work with ZX Ventures a bit. Um, you know, I guess my question would be around kind of your target customer. Um, you know, on, on one side, you have big companies who do a lot of this work in-house or have, um, you know, pretty heavy lifting tools um, that do a lot of the stuff and they're willing to pay high prices. And at the other side, you have, you know, kind of SMBs and smaller folks who might not have the same budget size. How do you, how do you think about, you know, where that, where that target customer is to the point where they can pay you enough to be a profitable business or to be a successful business, but, you know, that you're still kind of meeting the need for SMBs that you're talking about, if you could speak to that a little bit. Yes, that's a great question. So we partnered with some of these uh, large platforms uh, serving small businesses, and there are referral partners. So they, uh, for example, with one of the leading uh, platforms serving the restaurant industry, uh, our pilot with them was so effective and, and successful that they eliminated their in-house marketing agency that was serving their uh, long tail restaurants. And, and now uh, because of our, our results really outperformed what they were doing with their agency, they're referring all their customers, all their restaurants to Otis. So, so with those partnerships, they're really channel partners for us and integrated partnerships that drive the acquisition of the long tail merchants, which are our true customers and our ideal customers are, are businesses that are established, but, but small in, in that either the business owner or a member of their team is, is using the product and, and they don't have a sophisticated and large marketing team. And what we found is that uh, they have an immense need for the value proposition that we're providing. And there's a huge potential addressable market of underserved small businesses that need an end-to-end -end solution to manage their digital marketing. Miguel, a lot of folks in your space have been challenged by some of the changes for, from Apple and iOS. Is that an opportunity for you or a risk? Um, given some of the changes that have been made? That, that's a great question. So in the beginning, when we started Otis, we made an incredible bet on the future of using first-party data to drive targeting and attribution, data-driven targeting and attribution to create these very precise uh, audiences and uh, advertising measurement for our customers. So this helps our customers surmount challenges that advertisers recently had with the deprecation of cookies, and mobile attribution challenges. So that this is what we're we're helping them with. And we, we also interestingly see that a lot of our customers right now are having great results. They're increasing their ad budgets and, and we're seeing ad costs uh, across the channels we advertise on stabilize and even uh, decrease in many cases. And we're driving efficiencies across those. And we think that's because a lot of large uh, larger growth stage companies have contracted their ad budgets. And we think that small businesses as a whole will be looking for effective ways and efficient ways to manage their marketing moving forward in this upcoming cycle. Thank you so much, Miguel. Um, another great pitch and uh, obviously good uh, good answers to the questions there. Thank you so much for taking the time. And uh, yeah, if you could put your, put your video off and we'll move to the next startup. Thank you. Thank you. Mark from Paid. Where are we? There we go. How are you doing, Mark? Hi there. Good to see you again. Uh, do you want to share your screen and then we'll get ready to kick off? Ready when you are. Okay, three, two, one, off you go. Hey, Startup Grind, thanks for joining us today. I'm Mark, the co-founder and CEO of Paid out of Canada. And I'm gonna do something today that we Canadians do better than anyone else. I'm gonna say that I'm sorry. I'm sorry for Nickelback's music. I'm sorry for Justin Bieber's behavior. And I'm sorry for the fact that you can't call Ryan Reynolds your own. He's out. I'm especially sorry to all of the merchants across North America that we signed up when I was managing director of Afterpay. I'm sorry for overcomplicating your payments ecosystem. 
And I'm here to tell you today how we're going to fix that with pay. What we know is that consumers' buying behavior changed forever over the last three years. Today's empowered consumer demands choice in payment method at checkout. And if they don't get that choice, we know that over half of them are going to go and buy it from somewhere else. We also know that there's been no innovation in payment acceptance since the QR code in 2011. And didn't that make the biggest comeback tour of all time over the last few years? Payments are expensive, they're complicated, and it's hurting business owners. So a few years ago, we imagined a world where with one relationship and one integration, we could help merchants and business owners all over the world get paid. Our platform, we have over 90 different payment methods that are unlocked with a single integration to pay. From our partners at Visa with traditional cards and our sponsor, American Express, to digital wallets such as Alipay, WeChat Pay, to the Buy Now Pay Later sector, Zip, for example. And we've even simplified crypto to USD payments for merchants and business owners through our partners at Binance and Paychain. It goes much further past there, but what we've done is built in smart workflows, solid integrations, so that we can take the complication and the cost of payments away from merchants and business owners. From SMBs looking to lower the cost and management of their payment ecosystem, charities and events looking for mobile donations and checkout, or retailers looking for queue busting solutions, we've got you. Pay brings simplified payments together through a single powerful interface, both online and in person, through a super cool smartphone tap to pay app. We're on a mission to help merchants all over the world get paid by turning 18 billion smartphones on the planet into payment acceptance devices. Our commercial model is we clip every ticket from every transaction and every payment method from every merchant using our platform. The result of that is for every billion dollars of transactions we process, our net revenue hits around $5 million US. We're targeting a $21 million raise uh, in equity financing to hit 10 million in revenue by the end of 23, 30, by the end of 24. Thanks so much, Startup Grind, and I welcome your questions, judges. Great stuff, Mark. Let's go straight into Q&A. Mark, Mark yeah. how do you... Go ahead. Sorry. Please. No, please, go ahead. Um, you know, SMBs are retailers, super crowded space, right? They're getting hit up every day. How do you, how do you like, cut through the noise? Great question. The biggest challenge that business owners have today is keeping up with the consumer's demand. So every new payment integration, for example, a new flavor of buy now, pay later, requires yet another integration, another relationship, another onboarding. So business owners are fed up with trying to keep up with this today. We're saying, hey, with the single integration to us, you can turn on or off through a dashboard, any of these different payment methods that you like, reducing the workload, uh, you don't have a team of 10 people out back working on your payments cartridge. You don't need it with us. Um, because we've built a cloud-based infrastructure uh, that uh, uh, requires no traditional banking rails, we can also do it at a much lower cost for these business owners as well. For example, a Visa or MasterCard transaction is around 1% cost to the merchant, not 25 to 3 that's a great segue to my question, Mark, which is tell me how did the economics work, which, you know, you, the integrations are really impressive. And I have a partner who worked at Stripe, the, but you kind of sit between the, the merchant and the integrations. So how do your economics flow? That, that's a great question. So we, uh, we, we take a clip of every transaction. So uh, we based it baked in our cost uh, uh, to the transaction of the transaction to the merchant. Uh, if there's a hundred dollar restaurant bill, for example, um, we'll take out the two percent or one percent of that transaction fee and settle the rest of that to the merchant. 
Okay, so you're taking some percentage of the normal every cycle of every so, Okay, but okay, thanks. All right, just a quick question. How are you actually going through your sales process? I mean, I like, especially if you're targeting all of these individual, like, do they all have to opt in and sign up individually? And if so, how are you like planning to reach ubiquity through, you know, one-off sales or what's the kind of strategy there? Yeah, really good question. So we've got a demand gen strategy um, that attracts and forms and converts uh, individual business owners to us in that sort of SMB category. Um, we've also got some really interesting distribution partnerships that are lighting up as we speak. For example, uh, we're partners with Visa on the tap to phone program that they're launching uh, in Q4 through Q1 in Australia, the US and Canada. Uh, we've also got distribution relationships with AML, KYC, KYB uh, vendors uh, across the world. Uh, one in America has got 100,000 approved merchants that we're co-marketing kind of into there. Um, so we're looking at categories where we have huge reach to uh, to merchants without having to go door to door. Great stuff. Thank you so much, Mark. I think that's time on Q&A. And uh, I still still love that accent. So it's great, great international accent you got. <laughs> um, good stuff. So on to uh, the final company. So last but not least, we have Mr. Daniel Rodriguez, founder and CEO at Pickup. Daniel. How are you doing? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. No, no problem at all. It's our pleasure. I know that you don't have a deck, um, so I'm not going to wait till you, you share. Uh, I'm just going to count down from three and then you can kick off, okay? Of course. Okay. Thank you. Three, two, one. The floor is yours. Thank you. I'm Daniel Rodriguez. I'm a co-founder of Pickup. Uh, basically, what I do is I help the people to save the time they will spend inside the car because of the congestion in the main cities of Latin America. And the way how do they, how I do it, it is that I created the motorbike taxi service in the main cities. I started in Colombia in 2018. And right now I have operations as well in Paraguay, Guatemala, and Mexico. Uh, right now I'm completing about 2 million of rides per month. I have a cash flow positive company. We are generating money. And we, our main market is Colombia where we started. But now this year, the next year, my focus is to conquer Mexico. Mm, we are completing 2 million of rides, which means that we are the third most important transportation system in Colombia. Uh, but we know that Mexico, they have the same problems, like in Brazil, uh, they have the poor infrastructure, they have bigger cities, longer trips, huge congestion, and we have already proven market fit. So that's the reason why we are very focused right now to, to, to conquer the, the other countries. And the next one it is Mexico. We started two months ago in Mexico, and we are already seeing an exponential growth in that country as well. Uh, I have a fleet of active drivers of 50,000 active drivers. And in the top of that fleet, we have continued building new business vertical. The second most important vertical that we have it is logistics. We started to do last mile, but we also do middle mile and flexible warehousing. And we are serving the Amazons of Latin America. That's basically what I do. Uh, and I'm happy to, to answer any questions. Well, you've got two extra minutes uh, left, so we can uh, feed that into Q&A if, uh, if the judges have, have it. So, uh, Luke, do you want to, should we start with you for Q&A? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with this space. I um, was an investor in Rappi um, a, a long time back and then um, familiar with Liftit and some of these other folks. Um, I, I guess my, my key question here, I just want to make sure I understand the, the product here. Um, are you... Are you like, are you a delivery service or what, what's the, why does it have to be a motorcycle or is it always a motorcycle? Are you a logistics provider for last mile? Are you like, if you can just double click on that a little bit more, I just want to make sure I understand like what market you're after going. Are you, are you serving, you know, people who want to move a package from point A to point B? Or are you serving like massive fortune 500s that are selling products in, in new cities? Sure, sure, sure. Good question. Uh, we started moving people, basically, and we started moving people on motorcycles because in a motorcycle you can save at least fifty percent of the time you would spend. Got it. So, so like, so like Uber for about with motorcycles. 
Yeah, correct, correct. Got it. Okay. It allowed us, it allowed us to have one of the largest fleets of, of Latin America, and on the top of that, of that fleet, we started to offer new services because we want the drivers to be busy the whole day and not just in the peak transportation hours of the day. Okay, got it. And now you're also delivering packages and is that parcel or is that, you know, do you have any like, um, you know, connection with like box trucks or car or like less than truckload or full truckload, or are you very much focused on, you know, leveraging the motorcycle uh, fleet that you own, own right now? Uh, yes. I, I, I... We mostly have motorcycles, uh, and it, it, it is because things are, are, are fast. And in, in the main cities, for instance, of Colombia and Mexico City, you can get a motorbike in the front of your door in less than five minutes, which is also great for e-commerce. E-commerce started to use us. That was the first use case on, on, on delivery. But then e-commerce asked us for another kind of services. And because of that, we have started to add another kind of fleets. Right now, we have cars, bicycles, and trucks. And um, yes, we we serve a lot of uh, CPGs, pharmacy companies in Mexico and in Colombia. Uh, and yeah, that, does it answer your question? <laughs> um, there's a few uh, folks in Indonesia, other markets in Asia who can be, do you have competition today? And, uh, and then can you talk a little bit about driver acquisition? So those two, kind of two-part question. Competition and driver. Sure. Yes, in the motorcycle, uh, right hailing space, uh, moving people. Uh, we have seen a couple of startups trying to do the same, but they die in, they die in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic for us was hard, but uh, it helped us to cut a lot of costs that we had. And after the pandemic, we started to grow again and we kept uh, uh, a cost structure very efficient. And that's the reason why we started to, to put money into the bank account. Uh, competition today, the only one surviving is, of course, Uber. We share a couple of markets uh, in Paraguay and Guatemala, for instance, and, and some small uh, cities in, in Mexico. Uh, however, we haven't seen the numbers decrease on those markets. I think that I have built a product from Latin America to Latin Americans. I know the drivers. I know what they like, what they want to hear, what they want to eat. I know how to engage them. And as you said, we have seen this already in Southeast Asia. Like, for instance, let's say Grab. We know that story and over then acquired them. And that's the kind of thing that I'm also achieving in Latin America. Uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, we have seen the motorbike market, which is huge. And um, it's going to grow, it's going to grow something similar in Latin America because of the economic conditions that are coming, that are already happening this year, but those that are, are going to happen the next year. Um, what I'm going to do it is to press the gas on the motorbike market to grow faster. That's why we are a, a key part of the next year in, in Latin America. Great. One quick question. You mentioned you had 50,000 riders. I'm just confirming it's a, it's a marketplace, right? Or are, are they employed by you? Uh, it's a marketplace. They are contractors. Uh, they, uh, it is 50,000 active drivers. On the passenger side, uh, monthly, we have at least 400,000 uh, passengers using our application. Brilliant. That wraps up uh, the Q and A. Thank you so much, Daniel. You did a, a good job there with without a deck. Um, thank you again for Thanks, your time. Daniel. Thank you. Okay, so that wraps the the five companies that we have today. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed uh, hearing their story, hearing their business, and the, the opportunity. Um, we're going to all take uh, about a minute or so just for the judges to consolidate their thoughts um, in the in the document we have. Make sure their scores are finalized. Um, and then we'll be back to announce the second place and the winner. Thank you, everyone.
Hi again, everyone. So the good news is that we have a result. We have uh, one, two, three, four, five, uh, all scored out. Um, I hope you'll you'll all join me in in, in um, posting your comments and, and congratulations in the chat to all the companies who, who pitched today. I think they all did a great job. Such you know diverse companies in terms of background and and, and location and, and also industry, um, but 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 all doing so well. And you know a lot of them have been in the community for a while. As I was just saying in the in the deliberation room, um, we are so you know so kind of happy and proud to see them growing and, and doing so well. So what we're going to do now is announce the winners. Uh, I, I want you all at home to to kind of uh, bang your bang your tables or whatever, create your own virtual drum roll. Um, we'll we'll announce the runner up first, and then we'll announce the winner, and then we'll bring the winner back on just to do a quick kind of reminder to everyone um, for what of what they do, and then um, they can do, uh, put an ask out there as well and, and give uh, give a, a way that you can contact them um, if you if you think you can support or if you're interested in investing um, or anything similar. So without further ado, uh, the winners are about to be, or the winner is about to be announced. Um, I guess if you could just quick click through to the next slide, we have runner up first and virtual kind of drum roll here. I'm going to do one at home. Second place goes to drop stat. Fantastic job. Thank you so much, Sarah. You did a, a yeah, it was a great, never easy going first and uh, great to see you coming in, in second there. Uh, congratulations and, and, and thanks again. Okay, so now on to announce the winner. So first clip, first place again, and virtual drum roll. First place goes to Educate Online. Fantastic job. Alexander, can we bring you back on? Yeah, I, I made a video with my phone and I'm still making it. Oh, uh, you're doing it. <laughs> I love it. You're you're here live. This is this is very meta. Uh, <laughs> yeah, congratulations. How do you feel? Thank you uh really like honestly i'm not about winning competitions i'm I'm about contributing to the world but once yeah. this thing started i got uh I'm, I'm going to formula one soon the final and the world cup and everything and uh, i felt like i was on this uh pitch uh, with all the soccer players and <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> totally honored totally honored well, firstly, yeah, I'm, I'm envious that you're going to the Formula One. So uh, I'll, I'll start with that. Yeah, come join us in Abu Dhabi. <laughs> oh, amazing. <laughs> you're welcome. Yeah. Um, I'll contact you about it afterwards. Um, no, so uh, do you want to just take a couple of minutes, just remind people what you do? And then also, I think, just just I think tell everyone, you know, what's the one thing that you're looking for right now? Either help or um, tell people a bit about your round. And uh, now's, your, now's your time. Thank you. So uh, just to remind everyone, um, and once again, many thanks. It's a true honor and super blessed uh, to be here. So um, what we are doing is we're creating a platform uh, that allows students to study online in the world's best schools. And um, right now we are connecting more schools and more students and uh, and basically growing in the emerging markets. And I think um, such countries as Canada and the US uh, who are present here were all built by immigrants and usually the people that come into the countries the students and um and then they they are very eager to achieve uh, you know so uh so I, I think it will um what we're doing is good in terms of um our traction we are um starting to raise a 30 million dollar equity round and uh right now we are looking um for investors with whom we'll make a good team which means that um, it's not about the money because the money we can get here, 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 here. Uh, it's about uh, having the vision. And uh, um, right now we're estimating to raise $30 million uh, within um, three to six months. Um, so if you'd like to get in touch with us and with me directly, uh, shall I, how, how shall I, <laughs> uh, how shall I share my you contact details? You can just share your uh, your email address or, or or an email that you're happy for people to contact you at, but we can yeah, also yeah, share share it afterwards as well. Um, yeah, so you can or actually the the easiest thing is just to put my name into LinkedIn, Alexander Zeltov, and you'll find me really really quickly. But um, also Alex at educate this higher than underscore how do you call it hyphen or yeah hyphen yeah so Alex at educate hyphen online dot io um alex at educate-online.io email is 
super easy as well. I'm always checking it. So um, it'd be awesome to have a conversation and to see how we can build the future of education together. And also, um, I was watching all the other pitches and I'm like, guys, you do, you're doing such an amazing thing. We'd love to integrate all the payment systems. Because you know when you're dealing uh, with so many countries, uh, it's 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 a really big thing, especially like in Latin America, you have one method of payment. Sure. <laughs> yes. And um uh, the nurses, I mean, super, super excited, guys. Uh, I think we're building a great future um, and a great today in very turbulent times. And I'm really grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. And I wish we could hear everyone giving you a round of applause right now. Unfortunately, uh, we're we're not able to do that. But um, once again, thank you so much. And I think I, I definitely echo everything you said. I know that the judges do, too. Um, a lot of great companies. Um, honestly, it's so inspiring working at Startup Grind and being able to kind of help and support and bring all these startups together and hearing everything that you guys are doing. So yeah, thanks to you. Um, thank you to, to the judges as well. Uh, Neil from Defy, Shripriya um, from uh, Spiro and, and to Luke Harrington as well. Uh, and thanks to everyone who's watching as well. Well done to all the startups. And uh, just before uh, we start the VC panel, I also want to make sure uh, that everyone here knows that your digital gift bag as um, Jamila mentioned earlier, will soon be landing in your inbox. Um, it includes a selection of discounts and perks from the partners uh, that help make this, this summit possible, as well as a few freebies and offers from our startup members as well, um, some of which were, or some of whom were, were pitching just now. Uh, next up, I will see you on the main stage for our VC panel on why timing is critical and now is the time to play offense. Thank you so much. I've been Alex Gordon-Furs. Thanks again to the judges and the startups and see you soon. Thank you.